Hi, my name is Phil Cashin. Welcome to the Winter Circle. Uh, this is season one, episode six. So for those of you who have seen the Winter Circle in the past, and for those who haven't, let me kind of give you a little bit of a, of a preview of what we're trying to accomplish. So this week, we're going to interview the winner of last weekend's two-day national PRS match, the Precision Rifle Series. Um, PRS shooters, uh, I don't think many people would argue, are probably some of the best precision rifle shooters in the world. Uh, we certainly dominated the IPRF last year, and this is a sport that we just do really well. We have the best shooters in the country. And by default, if you won last weekend's two-day national match, you that weekend were the best shooter in the country. So what I'm trying to do is extrapolate some information out of the winter uh, to kind of help shooters like me and other shooters you know, get some insight, some information to help us perform better in matches, whether it's mental, whether it's physical, match prep, ammo, whatever. So uh, that's really what we're trying to accomplish. Now, the winner of last weekend's VPRC, a Rifleman's Revival, up in Rocky Mount, Virginia, was Keith Baker. So, Keith, welcome to the podcast. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on here. Oh, it's my pleasure, man. That was a, that was a great performance last weekend. No, it was it was a match. It was right up my alley. I mean, Andy and Brian, they they always just like and they just think every stage out. They try and make everything doable, but they kind of push the limits a little bit on every stage. And and it was windy and the conditions sucked, which just is what I love to do is shoot a positional <laughs> match with changing conditions. So it was uh it, it was a good weekend for me. So well, good deal. Well, okay, so uh, Keith, why don't we start with the basics? Uh, what can you tell us about yourself and and your kind of your how you got into long range precision shooting? So I'm Keith Baker. I've been I've been shooting competitively in one thing or another since I was a kid. I mean, I competed in national archery competitions when I was five, and then I did shotgun for years, and then bullseye for years, and then I got out of it for a while and then uh, all of a sudden I got into bass fishing and I tournament bass fish for a ton of years 20 25 years and um uh, and then I I cut my thumb off at work and I lost use of my hand and I wasn't able to fish at the level that I had been for some for some time so when that happened I mean I, I'm crazy competitive everything I've ever done has been I'm a I mean I have an addiction and that addiction is competition right either with myself or someone else, but that's, <laughs> it, it's both good and bad. If you ask my wife, it's bad, but I could have worse addictions. Right. That's right. Um, but, uh, you know, so I, I went from, you know, in a place where I was fishing and doing really well competitively there to where I wasn't able to compete at that level anymore. And, and, uh, I ran across the right handful of guys, um, one day at the range when I was just getting my hunting rifles together. Um, I've got property in Southern Ohio. That's got just a pile of big Eurasian boars. And I started shooting them farther and farther away. And um, realistically, I run into the right guy who happened to get me down the path of long range shooting and PRS shooting. And uh, boy, once I met the people in the sport, it just grabbed me. Like it, it wasn't, you know, it was kind of cool what you could do with a rifle, but then when you met the group of individuals that's in this sport, I mean, that's the addiction. And it's not, it's not, you know, what a rifle does. It's just, you know, how many, I mean, I met six people I liked in my entire life of bass fishing and, you know, I've met about a hundred, almost every PRS match. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing the group of individuals that were fortunate to be around. So. I got into the PRS, then I started, I got in with the right people. I started shooting against great people like Dave Ostrowski was the one that got me in. And then he introduced me to Dave Preston. And then he introduced me that, you know, it just, it just snowballed from there. And once you got around a great group of individuals uh, and uh, I had to figure out how to afford it, which was the hard part right you know because the sport really got expensive really fast mm -hmm. you know it was like i was going to build my first rifle and uh you know i'm like well how much do i need to build a rifle and he said two thousand dollars like all right i can come up with that and 
that doesn't include a scope. Wait a minute. Hang on. How much is a scope, right? You know, I'm thinking three hundred dollars. I can get a mill dot from Natchez, pretty reasonable. And uh, uh, he's like, no, no, you're going to spend twenty five on a scope. And uh, that that was pretty tough in the beginning to 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 navigate that and figure that out. But then once I started, once I seen what it was and what we could do, and then I just kept getting overwhelmed with how the capabilities of a bolt action rifle. I mean, you know, I every day even today i can't believe what we can do with a bolt action rifle and every day i go out there i see the next level of what it can do and uh between that and the people it's it's just awesome I and mean, we put we're pushing limits and making targets smaller and smaller and and making positions faster and and harder and and we're we just i, I don't know where the top's going to be i can't wait to find out you know it, it is amazing I mean, just, you know, I look back, I mean, just three, four years ago and, you know, like you go back and you look at an old stage book, you know, from a match back in, you know, 2018 or 2019 and you're like, wow, I wish I could go back and shoot that match now <laughs> So, with, with, right. with what we you know, know today and with the, what our, our training has become and the rifles and the accuracy capability and understanding wind and mirage and whatever. Wow. It really has changed. We were shooting full size zip six at 600 yards and now we're shooting six and seven inch diamonds. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy what we're doing and we're doing it from position and we were laying on our bellies before, you know, I mean, it's, uh, I, I don't know where the top is, but it's, it's really cool. Uh, and, and then every year I see another shooter who just gets that much better. And, and I, I, I don't know. I just, I love the, the bullet technologies move forward because of it. The powder measuring technology has moved ahead of, of the game i mean every little piece of this puzzle and it's because you know a lot of other sports like fishing you know uh nobody would tell their buddies what they're doing right everything was kind of its own thing in this sport there's a lot of sharing of information you know and i think it comes to it was typically started in a military side where um you know you wanted to beat the guy next to you uh more, more than anything but you only wanted to beat him at their best so you would lift them up, give them all the information you could to make them better, which would in turn make you better. And and I and it's fortunate that I think we're still keeping that trend right now. Yeah. Um, and uh, and by doing that, we're sharing information. You've got, you know, the best gunsmiths sharing information between each other. You've got the best reloader sharing information between e each other. And nothing's a big secret. And in that is is then we're we're asking for better bullets because of it. We're asking for better powder measures because of it. We're asking for, you know, uh, better K brass, you know, uh, quality. We're asking for, you know, and, and, we're, and we're testing it and we're proving it. And if it meets the standard, then it moves forward. It's it's really, really cool what we're doing. Well, yeah. and I think you, you touched on something I think is um is really important, I think, to the growth of the sport. And and for those who are listening, who are, who are part of the PRS and have been in, in it for a while, you know that this is how it is. But for those who are just kind of getting into it, and I'll and I'll I'll speak specifically about Keith. Um, you know, this sport is one that we a lot of Type A personalities. We all want to win. We're highly highly competitive. But you know, the ability for us to share information, share technology, give win calls, and you come on. I, you know, I'm trying to beat you at a match and I come off and, you know, you and I are shooting the same bullet and have the same zero. I'm telling you what my win call is. I'm giving you information so that you can beat me, you know, <laughs> and that, that is so you unusual in any kind of competitive sport, but it just kind of goes to the, you know, the character of the people and, you know, how much that we all just enjoy the activity. The sport is just so much fun. And, you know, and look, we're, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, when Brian Dennis uh, owned the PRS and he was bidding, putting big cash payouts for winning a match, you know, things kind of started changing not so well at that time for just that general high level of camaraderie. And, and that went away. And I think that was a really good thing for the sport. You know, so Keith in general, I think, two is it two years in a row that you won the Sportsman of the Year award, you know, for the PRS? It was a, it was uh which uh, anyone who hadn't shot with Keith, uh, if you ever see him at a match and you have a question, don't don't worry about feeling uneasy about approaching him to ask a question because 
you probably enjoy and look, a lot of us really enjoy it, but I think you kind of take it to the next level of, you know, speaking to newer shooters and giving them your knowledge and education. And that, that is a really important aspect of the growth of this sport are the, the leaders, the high end shooters, the ones who have been involved in a long time being able to share that data and you do a great job of it. So, um, so if you ever see Keith at a match, don't be intimidated, go up and talk to him and you will learn something. I guarantee it. Thank you. You, and I mean, that's that, that's the that's that way with most of the shooters in this sport, though. You can pretty much walk up to anybody, ask them any question, the very best shooters, and they're going to do everything they can to help you. Uh, I mean, that's so we've got a real culture up here in the Northeast that, uh, gosh, we used to have Wednesday night. Uh, every Wednesday night we had a match. And those were my favorite matches because I would go to those matches and I would spend the entire match helping everybody that's never shot a match. And I had so much fun doing that. And I mean, you know, and that's where, uh, not necessarily for me, but that's where Allie came, you know, Allie used to go to every one of those, Alex and Zane used to come to every one of those Wednesday night matches. And I remember, you know, a, a guy by the name of Bill would just go there and help dial her turrets. Right. You know, because she wasn't strong enough to turn the daggone turret. Right. You know, and I mean, it, it was, uh it, it was really cool to see the atmosphere that 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 grew in here in the northeast and then it continues i mean pretty regularly and and then from that i seen how many people got into the sport and how much fun that they had and uh and and that became a big deal to me like that became a very important part of what i do i'd i'd rather help you win i mean i always want to win but i would rather help you win um than I would win myself. Right. I mean, you know, I just, I, I would, if I can, if I can help you get better and you're a new shooter. And then from that point on, you remember that it's a huge win for me. Right. Absolutely. I mean, that's uh, it, it's, it's really, I don't know. It just goes down to, it's a culture that we've kind of push up here and we see that a lot and it, it spreads like it's addictive. Like, you know, once one person does it, then the next person does it. And, and uh, and then and then you just the the region grows more and more and more. So it's a lot of fun. So it is. It's my thing. Well, so let's talk about the match. Um, so tell me about this past weekend's match and how it went, the weather, the you know, your your thought processes, and just give us kind of a rundown. So uh, VPRC is held at Pig River. Uh, that's a place that I typically struggle a lot. Um, uh, it, it's, you know, I'm real good at watching the bullet and making a good correction. And that place is always switchy. That place is always tricky. And every time I think I'm doing everything right, I end up doing half of it wrong. Um, and, uh, I spent a lot of time the week before trying to figure out how to, how to have a, how to shoot well there, because I, I just never, never do. Uh, I love that place. It's a lot of highly positional stuff, but, but uh, you know, we had good cloud cover on day one, so we didn't have a lot of mirage. That place has a lot of mirage sometimes. Uh, Andy and Brian were real good to start us about a half hour or hour later than normal because the sun rises directly in, at downrange there, and that really makes it tough to spot the targets in the shadows. So, you know, they they delayed the mornings about a half hour each day to make sure the sun was up over the trees and you weren't looking directly into the sun, which was a, a, a real nice thing. So that helped me and other shooters. I mean, it helped everybody there. Um, uh, they uh, their, their target sizes were all realistic. Uh, they were small enough that you had to think, but big enough that you could play the play the role of averages a little bit right you could say well if the wind because the winds were all switchy i mean they they it was a fishtailing wind the whole time and that place is known for that right it it's mm -hmm. a yeah. at that time it was a 5 30 to seven o'clock wind almost all day and then occasionally it would be a full value i mean it was it was really cool so you had to be in the game a lot throughout the match you couldn't take your eye off the target you needed to pay attention what everybody was doing what the wind was doing each time and what the big ends of the switches were so you could build a bracket and uh 
and apply that to the target, right? Because, I mean, if you watch just two or three shooters, you might think, okay, well, they're holding any well where from two tenths right to four tenths left. And then all of a sudden, somebody picked up a full value in, right? <laughs> and uh, and uh, what I picked up on is there was three MPA flags lined right down the ridge line there. And they, they told the truth. Anytime that that, that wind went to a full 90 degree, those flags were at a full 90 degree. So, you know, when it, when it picked up to where you would need eight tenths or a mil, I looked over and those flags were just laying perfectly flat, right? Wow. It, there was a little bit of a switch in between the two. Like it would, uh, it, it would, you know, there was a delay, like the flags would go and then all of a sudden the bullet would go that way, you know, or, you know, you, you would see a change. There was about a two to four second change before or that wind moved the flags or the flag wind actually moved the bullet. But one or the other, if if you kept track of what the flags were doing, you had your best odds of what was going on because they sat down in that valley. They put them alongside the road and the feather flags are a beautiful thing if you have them around. So Yeah, they're great. They're great wind flags, aren't they? <laughs> yes, they are absolutely great. <laughs> okay, so now when now when when you're when you're going through your stage, how frequently are you actually glancing over to those those wind flags to get an idea about when? I'm watching them for about the five minutes before I go up, and then uh, you know, shooter, do you understand the course of fire? I look over and I watched them for probably five to ten seconds to see what they were doing. And if they were in a trend and then I made that decision for my first shot. Uh, and then from that first shot, I was real careful to manage recoil real well and make all my corrections off of that. Also, if I felt a wind switch on my face, I applied it downrange uh, or I applied half of it downrange. If I was, you know, I, I tried to work myself where, I knew with the left to right wind that I was okay because it never got more than that. Being on the right side of the plate, knowing it was going to switch back. Uh, but if I felt it gust harder on that side, then I would bring that a little closer to center. But I was 100% comfortable with using all of the plate. Uh, and uh, and that was it was good I was able to see that this weekend. There's Sometimes you can't, you don't have the mental capacity to do all that. Uh, I've learned a lot here uh lately with um i've been been really trying to figure out how to get more of that mental reserve and i found that sleep is a big part of it like uh, i used to drive all night to make it to a match and then show up and get four hours of sleep and think i was good enough to do that and and i and, and maybe i was when i was younger i don't know whether it, it's an age thing or not but i i will say that i make it a point now to try and get eight hours of sleep or as close to it the night before the match in the night between the match. Right. And I, I try not to, to burn that wick too short. And I find that those mental reserves and that ability to pay attention to five or six things is a lot easier to where you can see the flag. You can watch what's going on in a target. You can kind of feel that on your face and make corrections at the same time versus, Oh, I hit that move it to center shoot again. And just focusing on one or two tasks, I could feel that on my face and think, ah, I'm going to favor a little more right now or a little less right now. Or I felt it hit the other side of my face and I'm going to let it go, you know, make make a drastic change before I seen it on plate. You know, in that place, I've uh, I've learned that really the wind you feel on top of that mountain is pretty close to what's down there. But you still got to check the flags and make sure that they're not lying. <laughs> okay so that you know for, for sh shooters that are listening to you that um may try and understand a little bit more about what you're telling them uh, and, the, and the feeling of the wind on your face so let's just say you're you're shooting a a 66 percent ipsic at 600 yards right so it's probably i don't know four tenths wide or what have you maybe maybe half mil wide <clears throat> And you've got a, you know, a, a wind coming in behind you and it can be going in from, you know, five to seven, you know, so it can be moving and you're, and you're, you know, playing middle to edge typically where you're going to be holding. Right. And you feel right. a wind gust that makes you question that hold. Now that's kind of a, that's, 
that's not a timid move to then alter your aim point for that shot after the one that you just hit with the correct wind hold that you feel something on your face that makes you then change that next shot and you actually do it. I mean, is that, is that what you're telling me? That's what I was doing at this match. And the reason I was doing that is I was able to focus down range when everybody else shot and watch them work in the center of the plate. And then I felt that puff on my cheek and all of a sudden they're off the edge or on the edge. Right. And then you know, and throughout the match, instead of doing anything else, I focused through a pair of binoculars the entire time of what was going on. And when I felt that puff, I watched what happened with the bullets. And I seen them starting to trend right when when I got that wind on the right side of my face. And they trended left when they was on the left side of the face. And and then when it went nothing, it still had a left to right. So I kept trying to to track that throughout the day and I don't know why this time I had the the extra mind to 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 believe it every time because that's not you know I'm used to shooting a, a lot in the southeast where there there's not a lot of wind sometimes and you know you just make small favors to the middle of the plate um but I realized at that match for the last 2 3 years I've never really shot well there and it was because I was afraid to make those bold decisions and, uh, you know, shooting out West a lot here lately and, and, and so forth. Um, I've kind of, I'm like, well, use the whole plate. And if I'm feeling it, trust it. And I was going to trust it till it didn't work. And it just, it seemed to work both days. And uh, it, we had some really, really gnarly wins and, some real switchy wins that that just changed i mean a, a half a mil to a mil of change throughout 90 seconds of time you know um and and really the stage it really got me is we went inside of a conix box and uh when i stepped inside the conix box and i couldn't feel anything i dropped four points inside that conix box because of all the switches I was able to see things down range, but I, I couldn't keep up with the switches. I didn't feel the gust and then watch the bullet start to move to, over. You couldn't feel anything. So I was just basically shooting blind and all of a sudden, you know, I missed and I had to make my best guess because it was into the ether behind it. There was no feedback from that position. I know that stage. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, it was, you just had to make good decisions. Well, and I made two good decisions and I made two bad decisions and that cost me four points. You know, I made two good decisions, but they weren't good enough. And then instead of making bolder decisions, I'm like, well, I had to be wrong with my first decision. So I feel like I made two good decisions mm -hmm. making, you know, a target correction or, you know, three quarter of a target correction. And then I made, uh, I went back to to what I thought it was, instead of continuing to make bigger corrections. And I needed to make bigger corrections. I needed to make a two target correction, you know, as opposed to by correction. I mean, the target was say six tenths wide. I went from holding like two tenths left to uh, three tenths right, or, and then all of a sudden I really needed five tenths right you know, and I went back to two instead of making it all the way out to five. So that is it so, got me that twice. Is, it's so hard to do during a stage is when you're holding one side of the plate to make a change to holding on the other side of the plate. That is so mentally difficult to do, you know? Right. Well, and I'm like, okay, well, maybe it didn't change. Maybe I did something wrong. You know, I admit, you know, and that, that I've learned seems like every time I think, oh, I did something wrong. Uh, and I, I do, I make the same mistake twice. You know what I mean? So, oh, I, I must've shanked that one and uh, I'll just do that same shot again, or, you know, I'll make a small half a 10th correction or something. And, uh, and I was afraid to make the bold corrections. And, uh, I've been shooting a lot with Andy Slade and he makes, he makes giant corrections. I mean, he's, he's not afraid to make 
uh, well, 90% corrections. And, uh, uh, and I'm like, well, if it's shaped like a circle, I'm going to make 60% corrections, right? I've always been conservative and, uh, I've learned conservative isn't always the best route whenever you're dealing with switching conditions. So he, he's talking like target width, bold yes. offset changes. Yeah. So he'll take, um, uh, a five tenths target. And, you know, if he's holding two tenths left and he feels the wind is coming from left to right, then uh, he would, you know, do 90 percent of that target correction. So if it's a five tenths wide target, he's probably going to apply another four, four and a half tenths to to his two tenths hold to make it a six, uh, six and a half tenths. Right. Whereas typically I would add three. You know, I, I, I was always a little more conservative uh, when I'm shooting on the East Coast, right? You know, I mean, when you get out West, it's different. But uh, out here, we generally don't see those big switches. And down there, we do. I mean, I went from holding uh, half a mil right on our target to nine tenths left, right? And and hitting hitting the target very well center. And then all of a sudden, I had to jump with a mill correction, mill and a half correction. So um, it's uh, it's a lot of fun when it's like that for me. You're because hitting. I mean, it's like, <laughs> right. I mean, for me, it's like, oh, wow. Hey, this is cool. I don't get to do this very often, you know? Um, and then it's, it's cooler when it works. It's less cool when it doesn't. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, you said something there. I think that a lot of, um, and I, I see it in uh, a lot of shooters, you know, even really some really good shooters. If they don't make bold adjustments. They're not paying attention to the width of the target. You know, mm -hmm. they, I think if you're, you know, when you're looking at shooting the stage, if you're not measuring the width of the target, you're making a big mistake. I mean, you have to know the, I mean, you have to know the width of the target. I and mean, I like to tell people, Hey, look, the target's a half mil wide. And if you're aiming the left edge and you miss off the right side holding two tenths and the target's half a mil, add a half a mil to it. Go to seven tenths. Then you may hit on the other side of the target, but at least you got the target feedback. You know, but it's amazing how how often and even some really good shooters, they'll miss off the right. And then the next shot they just miss a little less off the right. A little off the right. <laughs> you know, it's still a miss. You know, yeah. but that that to me like that that was probably my hardest challenge was learning to make something more than just a little adjustment, you know, it's, it's hard to do, but. Yeah. And I mean, and reticles are key. I mean, so I kind of, I can't wait till somebody comes out with a set of binos with radical that, you know, uh, but uh, because I get fatigued looking through a spotting scope all day, I don't, I'm not able to stay in the moment 100% of the time. When I'm looking through a spotting scope, I kind of want to give my eye a break after a while and then go back to it and get back. Whereas the binos, I can just sit on them all day and I can really pay attention to what's going on and stay in that moment all the time. Um, and fortunately, every time I, we've got someone in a squad who's got a spotter and uh, one of the first things is, hey, what's the, you know, what's the width of the target? what's the height of the target if if that comes into play or you know i look see if there's circles or squares and diamonds or whatever and uh but realistically the width of the target is the is the most important thing before i even start writing my wins down because i want to have plan a plan b and plan c down especially in a in a match like that and basic i will have those different wins wrote down and then I'm watching and watching and watching and trying to figure out where I'm going to fit into that bracket. Um, and some of the match directors, I, uh, uh, I think, uh, Ken Wheeler, who's now the PRS, uh, the owner of the PRS, I believe he used to put all the target wits in his matchbook. And, uh, that was really a cool, uh, I, I believe it was Ken. And that was really a cool thing. Like I could look in there and be like, Oh, okay. These are, five tenths wide diamond circles, squares, whatever. Um, and, uh, and it was, that was really nice. It was good information that would allow me to do that bracket in my book. Right. And, uh, 
as I'm getting ready for my next stage, I would have a better idea of what I was going to do. Good deal. Um, okay. So let's see here. You are, you've really turned long range precision shooting into a career. You know, you, uh, you know, Keith, Keith and I have a, a really nice long history together. You know, we, we, yeah. we know each other personally and, you know, you used, used to be in a different business. Uh, you had an opportunity here a number of years ago to get out of that business and into a, you know, a long, in, into this long range precision as a profession. I, I, I see something over your shoulder there that you may kind of use on a periodic basis to conduct business. So tell, tell us a little bit about, about ice rifles and kind of how you got into this. So I, I mean, what happened was I found the people in this sport. Right. Uh, and I met just the greatest people in the world. And I realized that I am not going to be able to be competitive in this sport forever. Right. And and uh, and I and looking at that, I realized that I'm I'm going to lose the opportunity to be around these people. Right. So I, I had to figure out a way to do that all the time. So I sold my business. I owned HVAC business for 20 some years. I sold it. And basically uh, started full time building rifles and traveling the country shooting matches. And uh, because I figured that I would be around these people for the rest of my life one way or another. And when I can't shoot anymore, uh, then I'll be building their rifles and I'll still be, you know, in and around them. Uh, and that that's that's pretty important to me. So um, I ran across a few great opportunities you know, over the years, I mean, I, um, I work with MDT in, in, in design and development. I drive the van around the country, which uh, helps me a lot. And they, they do a lot to, to, uh, you know, they supply me with all kinds of stuff to fix anybody's, uh, rifle that goes down at the match. And, you know, it seems like I spend, you know, an hour or two after every match, you know, working out of the back of that truck, doing some tweaking or, uh, helping someone with a trigger that might go down or, or whatever, you know? Um, uh, or helping them, you know, understand what happened on the stage and, you know, try and break that down for them. Uh, it, it's made it a little bit of a job. So it's been tough to be competitive when that happens, when you're going week after week and you're on the road and you're spending so much time driving and, uh, um, uh, then, you know, it's kind of tough to have it be, to be competitive and want to work extra hard, um, uh, when you it's your everyday thing right so you, you you've got to you've got to have a little bit of a getaway so you know if you work at it 100 percent of the time and your job is also your hobby um that makes your hobby not so much fun sometimes right you know yeah um but uh then i got into you, you know i i wanted the next level of accuracy i i wanted my brass to work across you know in this game, we, what, we buy 500, 1,000, 2,000 pieces of brass, 3,000, and we want it to work in seven barrels, right? And and I wasn't able to achieve that. It was, I'd be like, oh, wait, man, my barrel went out. I spin a barrel on. I go to stick my brass in there, and all of a sudden it sticks. Or I got a little click at the top, and it's Friday or Thursday, and I've got to get something together, and I, I can't afford to go buy new brass. I can't get components to do it, whatever. Um, so I... I wanted to start chambering my own stuff. So a, I could get it in a timely manner. And then as I refined that, uh, the processes to where my brass would work in every chamber. And, um, and, uh, now it's to the point where I don't even have to change my die in the last 10 or 15 barrels. Um, that basically I have one and a half thousand shoulder bump with all of them. I take, I don't have to, I have to take two rifles that are loaded, that are exactly the same. And then I just take the ammo out of one and put it in the other. And if I'm not happy with how that one's shooting, I just grab rifles and don't change ammo and it, and it works just fine. Right. Um, so that's made it a little easier time-wise to do that and being able to control, uh, things with the CNC machine has, uh, I mean, with a manual I could do, I could make great, great chambers and do great things, but there was always that human error, right? And with the CNC, it has its own errors. But what I tried to do is do a hybrid between the two of how I do things. 
And I've been able to come up with really, really consistent chambers that, you know, maintain a dimension that's almost exact. Takes a little longer for me to do them that way, but uh, I'm not into seeing how fast or how much money I can make. I just want something that's never going to give me a headache. And and uh, most of the guys that I build rifles for, that's exactly what they're looking for too. So they want to just pick up a rifle, spin a barrel on, have it head space the same, everything go the same, have it have the brass fit exactly the same and size exactly the same and um and then just keep going instead of spending their time they should be practicing or with their family or whatever trying to rush to get a rifle ready to go shoot a match that they paid a thousand dollars for with hotel and travel and everything the next week they can just thread something on and you know put a couple hundred rounds through it and be good to go yeah well, you certainly have a very good reputation out there. I know a number of shooters who are uh, running your barrels and they say nothing but great things. So I know, um, I, and you have the right mind for it. You know, you've got kind of an engineering kind of base mind. And I remember when you kind of were getting kind of going down that path, you know, some of the questions that you were asking uh, with respect to programming and tooling and methodology and what have you, that you were going to really pick up on it pretty quickly. And obviously you've, you've done that. So good for you. Well, and you helped me back then when I, I mean, you helped me in a lot of ways over the years, but. Um, I know that, you know, when I, you had a, a lot of experience buying machines over the years and, and so forth. And when I went to buy my machine, you were, you know, I'm like, okay, I have seven to look at here. I'm going to buy one of these. Which one do I want to buy? And you're like, buy this one. So. Uh, uh, did, did that work out well for you? <laughs> worked out really well for Good. me. <laughs> <laughs> I need another one. So I'll, I'll, I'll be calling you. <laughs> Okay, so let's see here. So last year, uh, if I remember correctly, earlier in the year, you had an injury uh, that kind of set you back for a while. And uh, and you ended up shooting uh, eight matches in 2022. I know you wanted to shoot more than that, but I think your body just kind of limited your ability to do so, right? Uh, and then uh, this year, you shot five matches so far, and I think you had one top 10. Now, I've known Keith for a lot of years and Keith is one of the best shooters in this sport and has been for a long time. And I, and I, and I know, I know you, I know how competitive you are and you are not, have not been happy with your finishes. So when you won the match this weekend, tell me how that made you feel. It was by far the best win I've ever done. So I got hurt 14, 15 months ago. And really before that, I was real sick with, uh, I had, I had issues for almost a year back to the, uh, the jab. Right. And, uh, I thought it was going to kill me. And, uh, whether it was that, or I happened to get the coronavirus the same time that I got it, I don't know what it was, but it, it really, really did me in pretty bad shape. Uh, and I just gotten healthy last February where I was back. I felt like I was a hundred percent and I was, I was really to go ready to go tear it up. And the first match back, um, it went from 50 degrees overnight. It dropped to 10 degrees and rain and it turned right to ice. So I overnighted myself a set of ice cleats so I wouldn't slip and, and get hurt. And, uh, first thing in the morning, we're getting ready for the match brief. And I go to reach into my backpack to grab my ice cleats that I overnighted and, uh, had one leg slip forward and the other one slipped back and I ripped all, all my hamstrings out of my pelvis. Well, from, you know, the years of martial arts and football and everything else, uh, my hamstrings and doing a hundred barricade drills a day for four or five years. I mean, uh, and being a big guy, my muscles we're not going to break, uh, but they ripped all the, the, the tendons out of the bone. I had nothing attaching my leg to my, to my body. So my leg went flying up over top of my head and, and nothing in the rear was attached. And apparently I didn't realize it at the time. That's one of the worst injuries you can have because it's all around the sciatic nerve and so forth. So I spent five months dead flat, like couldn't even lean up to see my toes flat um and completely immobilized and then uh, then after about seven months i was able to start getting up six months i was able to start getting up on crutches and moving around 
And I still go to physical therapy 14 months later, three days a week. Um, and, uh, uh, but finally I got my leg back to work in and so forth. And, and the hardest thing was getting back to shooting matches. Like I realized at that point that it was a, it was a game changing injury that, that very likely I was never going to be able to shoot again. And I didn't even know how well I was ever going to be able to walk. Uh, and up and only, only a month and a half ago, did they get the muscles working again? And it's cause I had some amazing physical therapist that, uh, started powering him up with electricity while he was pulling resistance against them and taught him to work again. And he just read this in a book somewhere that like the old Rocky Balboa, where they, you know, the, the Russian, they hooked the, the electrodes up to him while he's power lifting. Essentially that's what he ended up doing and taught my body to reuse those muscles. And, uh, and they've been working like progressively. And over the last month and a half, I've had like 90% progression. And I had to go to a couple matches last year that I could only shoot one, one round at because I wanted to shoot the AG cup. I've shot it from the very beginning. Um, and I want to shoot it every year. It's kind of, that was my goal was to try and shoot that. So I actually had to go to two matches and I only shot half a stage or one stage that helped get me, you know, the, 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 the ones needed before I could even really walk. Um, and I've had my absolute worst performances that I've had even since when I started, uh, in this last eight months. Um, and most of it was working through pain, right? If you, if you're dealing with pain, you can't be subconscious and pay attention to what's going on. But I worked really hard each time. And, uh, and so I was getting better and better as a shooter, but I couldn't do everything like my, I was able to physically pull the trigger. Great. I was, but I couldn't get subconscious. As soon as I would start to go into that subconscious state, ow, that hurts. Oh, don't hurt yourself. And you weren't able to get in that flow state. And really in the last month, month and a half, they've got, you know, they've got me to the point where now I'm, I'm, I've done all this work and now it's starting to pay off a little bit. Right. I'm, I'm able to get back to shooting. I feel like, as good as I ever have. And in the, in, in, in the very near future, I mean, I feel like I'm going to hopefully get better than I ever have, which would be the case as fast as these guys are getting better. I mean, you know, if five years ago, eh, the guys that are finishing 40th and 50th place would be winning matches. Right. You know, uh, and, and the sports just progressing super fast. Um, so I feel like I'm getting a little better each time and, uh, and everybody else is getting a little better and I'm hoping I can catch him <laughs> catch well, up anyway. So at the, at the mat, how many, how many shots did you win by? Uh, I don't know that answer. Uh, I think six ish. Okay. I, so I, I never looked at the scores when you, when I after the last stage, myself. did you, after that last stage, did you pretty much know you'd won the match? So I knew that I only dropped three points on the second day and I was leading by three and the two were in second place were in my squad. So I knew that I couldn't be beat at that point, meaning, you know, that somebody, uh, but on the other hand, the last stage of the day was by far the toughest stage in the toughest conditions. And I was pretty sure I was going to zero it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because the first two guys in front of me go up there and shoot like twos or threes and the conditions were just horrible. And I'm like, Oh, this is bad. Uh, you know, I mean, there, there was, there was, there was no good outcome. And I went and missed my first shot. Um, which I think I was holding about a half a mil right on a target. That's just sitting in the ether uh, on a hit on a ridge line that you can't see the miss on. And the next targets behind it's about 500 yard or uh, about 200 yards farther. And I'm watching the wind switch back and forth for every shooter. I mean, it was I'm like, oh, this is not going to be good. And uh, so I missed. I put another, I think, four tenth correction on the target and favored a little low. It was like a, a humanoid target. And I trusted my data. I'm like, all right, I'll aim for the bottom widest point. And I was able to see that bullet hit. Um, and from that, I knew that between that target and my next target 
there should be a two tenths wind change. So I added two tenths to what I hit with there. And, uh, and that, that was, uh, so I didn't know what I was going to hit it with. I knew I could hit it anywhere from left two tenths to right a mil. I mean, you know, it was, it was, it was just insane right then. But I, once I got that first hit, then I was able to apply it and then I just kept walking it. And I was real fortunate to only drop that first shot. But there was so many people that went through that stage. I mean, almost everybody in my squad dropped three, four, five, six. And I'm like, wow, finally I'm shooting great. And I'm going to, I get this stage with no feedback. And I could have shot at any time today. And, you know, and I would have had a berm on every other stage and not this one. And because it was too near, one far, far, near, far, 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 near, near, far, or something, you know what I mean? So if you got out of sequence or if you, weren't able to get a call on that first one you weren't really able to apply it right away to the next target it was a it was a very difficult stage and from and people were timing out and it was uh it was a little nerve-wracking and you and you missed your first shot oh yeah first oh shot gosh. and 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 i had to hold more wind than i ever thought than i thought i would need to hold but i'm like i know that it's blowing hard right to left so three tenths wasn't it. So let's go to six, right? Six, seven. And I think I put six or seven tenths on it. And then I hit. And uh and uh and I seen it, you know, I seen it hit. Um so I'm like, okay, add two tenths to the far. So that was seven, went to eight or nine, whatever that ended up being. And then I seen it was a pretty good hit, and then I had to come back to the near. And then when I went back to the near, it rocked left. So I knew I had to back down that wind a little bit, but I had to move. And by the time I moved, I had to do that again. And, and I basically, I had to chase it the whole time, but that first shot, I mean, I, I fully, I watched so many people miss that first shot left, right. And then you don't know what you're doing when you go to the far on the berm. Um, and so you're doing a wild guess. So the likelihood of dropping three or four was real, real easy, especially if you didn't get the first round hit. So, yeah, it was, it was, it was not good. <laughs> well, I mean, it, at what point did you finally just like know you'd done it and that feeling of, uh, I mean, two and a half, it's two and a half years, two and a half years. I mean, two and a half years since your previous victory, dude, that's phenomenal. I mean, I, I can only imagine how good that felt. I can pretty much tell you that the right, it, it felt great. And, uh, I did a year with it. That's, that's about how long I have not been able to shoot. Well, so, um, I mean, 14 months with the, with the leg and a year with, uh, all kinds of other issues. So it felt great. It, it really was what, what felt great about it is I went there with the intent and the desire to do it i worked hard um for the two weeks before uh you know i got a membership at a local range and i hadn't had a membership at a range to train at in about two and a half years i mean it's been almost three years um i used to have a place 45 minutes from the house i could train at and i don't haven't had a place to train in uh, a couple years so i bought a membership over at mkm you know a couple months ago and uh it's a two hour drive but you know i try and take you know a day every you know a day to work on everything before the match um to work on all my mistakes from the previous matches and that i have listed out and try and plug all the holes right and that list has been a lot longer lately here than i wanted it to be i've got plenty of holes to plug <laughs> well so you 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 mentioned something earlier in the podcast about recognizing that the pig river has not been your friend for finishing well at matches. I have the same affliction at that range, by the way. <laughs> so what, how did, and you mentioned that you had, you had done some early prep and some mental exercises, et cetera. Like what was your change in preparing for that match that you haven't shot well at in the past that obviously your plan worked out? What was it and how'd you do it? So, uh, the big thing was I, 
I went over and on the windiest days I could, I went over and trained at MKM, which is a switching headwind all the time. Okay. Uh, that's another one of those places. It's, uh, can get a little, little squirrely. Um, I picked, I, I took a two, two, three that had some really poor BC bullets. And I spent a lot of time reading plates, uh, with, you know, 75 grain hollow point boat tails, uh, you know, at six and 700 yards and they kind of steer corner, steer around corners sometimes. Um, and I did a lot of dialing. So instead of doing holdovers, I dialed everything where I was focused through my reticle on the point that I wanted that bullet to hit. Um, and when those winds got real switchy, I, I wasn't worried about timing out. I wanted to dial. So my focus was exactly where my crosshairs were. And then I could watch from that point where the bullet hit. And I dialed a lot of wind for the same reason. So instead of holding them, uh, you know, seven, eight tenths of a wind in my reticle, I literally dialed the low side of my wind or what I felt that I was going to do going in there, which is something I've never really done before. Um, I mean, I've done it. And if I needed four mils of wind, I dial three or whatever. But um, I didn't always dial my wind. And, and what I learned from the training I've done recently is by dialing that wind, I'm focused 100% on the center of that reticle. And when I manage my recoil correctly, then my eyes are still fixated on that target and not in this cluster of a moving reticle. So I'm able to keep it where I want it. And then I'm able to watch through that reticle. And if I held over on a stage, I'm looking at like three, four, five mils, I'm whatever that number is. And I'm looking through a net, right? And I don't know what's behind that net. And when it moves, my eyes are distracted to the movement and not or attracted to the movement and not necessarily to the target. So by dialing the wind, I'm able to focus and, you know, in my elevation on every target and, and, and so forth, I'm able to focus through that little dot reticle that I have on my vortex and focus specifically in the middle of the target. And then whenever, or, you know, and whenever I pull the trigger, I'm looking and expecting that bullet to hit that spot. And if it doesn't, I'm able to recognize exactly that was two tenths right of center or two tenths left of center versus if I'm holding like six tenths and I break that target, I don't know whether I hit it four or hit it one mil. I'm not I'm not seeing that because everything else is moving. But if I focus through my reticle, I was able to see my corrections and make better corrections quickly. Like I was able to say, OK. I held four tenths because I had it, whatever I ha I was holding one tenth left to center. And then I broke and it hit just to the right of my crosshair. So I didn't need to hold that tenth, you know, left to center. And I could make those corrections. Whereas if I'm four or five in that clutter out there, uh, I could make a quick guess. But I, it, it was harder to process what happened, where it was, where my crosshair was when I broke the shot you know, and, and go back and measure it. If I'm holding six tenths, it, it, it takes me longer to go back and put the six in the same spot and see that it was seven versus, I guess, yeah, just a tenth right or tenth tenth left. So you so you go up to the stage, you you know, you figured out what your wind call is going to be on the first target, you know, through watching and kestrel, et cetera. <clears throat> and you, let's say you're down half mil right, okay? And you make that first shot and you see that you needed to add two tenths of wind to it. Are you then immediately adding two tenths to that half mil click, click, or are you not doing that? Or did it depend on how point, much? Yeah. So that's the next thing I'm going to work with and see how I practice through that in my, in my book of things that I'm going to try and get better at, uh, I am going to do that. If I'm on a mover stage, hundred percent, I'm dialing that wind right now. Uh, on a non-mover stage, I'm able to apply that two tenths and then I'm focusing at that two tenths mark at that point because it's it's so close to the reticle. I'm 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 there. And then I'll make that and, and then basically, you know, my next target. Um to answer your question, yes, I, I will not dial it. I will just hold it in a reticle. But then let's say there's a three target sequence. I know that between target one and target three there's a half a mil difference in wind, right? 
in, in what my values are. So let's say I have four on the gun. I need two more at six. Instead of trying to look through my chart and see where that fits, I just know between that target and that target, it's a half a mil difference. So now it's seven tenths different. I'm holding seven tenths of wind out there. I don't know if I said that well enough to understand or not. So let's say if I have a target at 400, 500, and 600, and I'm holding two tenths, three tenths, and four tenths, right? For each one of those for that same wind hold. That's a one tenth difference between targets. So if I dial three tenths left on the first target, boom, if I would hit that center, then that would mean I would need from three tenths, I'd need four at the 500, five at the 600. If I shoot and all of a sudden I see I'm um, two tenths difference, I hold that two tenth mark on there. So now instead of needing four tenths, I needed six, then I then my next target seven, my next target eight, right? I just add a tenth to everything. If I hit it center with three, then I just add one and add one on out. Uh, I don't know that I worded that real well, but basically I'm just, I, I've done the math on my target card. Not only my win might be two, four, or six tenths, it's just the difference between target one and target two, I need two tenths more at the second target two tenths more at the third target. So whatever I find my wind on the first one, I just add two. And then once I find the wind on the second, I add two. When you're, so when you add in two, are you adding it on your reticle or are you actually clicking? You're adding two. Typically I'm making my, I'm, I'm adding it on the reticle. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So, cause I'm expecting to hit it center or probably center with my first one. And then I'm adding for the next one. So it'd be zero for the first one even though I have three tenths in. So if, if targets were five, six, and seven tenths, I would put, say, five tenths on the gun and likely hit center. And then I would hold one tenth on the next one and two tenths on the next one. That'd be five, six, and seven. Yeah. But if the, if the wind was considerably different, I would hold the two tenth mark or whatever it got me to center with whatever I have dialed and then just add one, add one. So if I, I needed two more tenths, so I'd hold two tenths on the first target, three on the second, and four on the fourth instead of trying to figure out the win. And those switching conditions, I, and if the wind switched in between those targets, it went to zero, well, then I knew that I only had to add one to the far. So I was able to keep track of those adds in between in those switchy conditions. Because if it switched 100% the other way and I had to hold two tenths opposite way, well, then I would just let off to zero wind at the far. So you, so you that. recognized a, a need for a change in strategy going to a match location where you haven't done as well as you have wanted to in years past. And you came up with that plan and you executed it and obviously it paid off. So I've watched others apply that technology through my experience. Um, you know, the dialing of the wind, I watched Tate, I'm like, I watch Tate Streeter. He dials wind on almost every stage as he goes out. He dials elevation and wind. I mean, and and he'll make a correction in the middle of a stage. And I'm like, how the heck did you get that done? Mostly because he's an Oki and they all use bipods. But he can reach up there and grab the daggone thing. And he's changing his wind as he's shooting a target, which is something I've never done. Um and Andy, I watched him. He started doing that all the time, dialing a wind. And I'm like, eh, I'll dial if it's big, but I can hold really good in my reticle. And then when it started going to the switchy winds, it was actually the weekend before this match. I shot one in MKM and I shot probably the best match I ever shot and didn't finish anywhere near where I wanted to finish. Uh, and it was real switchy conditions. And... I hit every small target and never hit the big targets because I finally got down to where it was supposed to be. But then I made a movement and by that time it already switched. So I really studied up on how to uh, make those transitions and those switchy wins, especially from those across, you know, 12 to one or, you know, 11 to one and so forth. Basically I needed a way to add to come up to instead of having wind holds that are just crazy down both sides, it's a two tenths difference between target one and target two and a three tenths difference between target two and target three. And that would allow me to go from a right wind to left wind and make a good correction. 
Uh, if I was near to far, far to near, near to far, I would make that initial dial on my first target if it was massively off. But if it's not, I could mentally keep up with it. Well, I think I think what you said is important that, you know, is, is if you if you're shooting in PRS matches and you've been doing it for a while, you know, you'll make gradual improvements. And then sometimes you hit a wall and you just you can't you can't seem to you may have subtle improvements but you just can't get past that point don't be afraid to make a change in how your you know your outlook your methodology you know talk to some people that you know that maybe have performed better and get some input and don't be afraid to try i mean what's the worst thing to happen is you have a poor score but <laughs> or you know you come up with an alternate method of how you want to shoot a match and then you might go and win a match just like Keith Baker <laughs> right so so don't be afraid to make that change it, it's it's tough to make changes but i i i think uh in those switchy conditions i will always make my initial dial or if nothing else i will always write down the difference between target 1 target 2 target 3 target 4 whatever the difference in wind is right to left and the difference is left to right. And I wrote those in columns on either side of my, my data card. So I had my normal, here's my data. And then I have my normal, here's my win one, win two, win three. And then if it was right to left, I was like, this was a one tenth difference between target one and target two and a two tenths difference between target two and target three. If it was the other way, it might've been two tenths and four tenths, right? And I wrote those in like just little side columns in a different color pen that uh, once I found my win for my first one, I was able to chase that win the whole time by applying what I knew from the target I'm on and then what the difference is onto the next one. And then I refine that one and what the difference is to the next one. So good deal. Uh, I hope work. it works again sometime. <laughs> <laughs> well. well. It's, it's good that you came up with the plan and it and it paid off for you. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about your equipment. Uh, what kind of optic are you running? Uh, Vortex Gen Three Razor, the six to thirty six. And what kind of reticle? That's the what kind of reticle? The EBR seven D is what the reticle is in that. Yeah. Okay. So it's a Christmas tree reticle. It's got two tenths holds and half mil holds. It has a dot. Uh, I would say the most, the thing I like more than anything is that dot reticle because I can focus my eyes right through the middle of that dot and, uh, and make in my mind, what are micro corrections, whether they are or aren't, but I can like pick a little piece of that plate out and focus that on there as I try to apply pressure to the trigger. And I think I hold more accurately because of that only because it's a mental thing. I mean, but it's, trying to put a crosshair there i seems like i just try and look right through the dot and at the plate and i i just love everything about it i i wanted a dot reticle for everything i shoot from here on out well they're, they're that's a yeah vortex makes great products and a lot a lot of top top level shooters are, are shooting them uh what kind of uh, mount or rings are you running so i use the short mount from mdt the one piece mount uh well, you know for years i use rings and uh, I will say once I've gone down the path of a one piece mount, uh, I will probably never run rings again. Uh, I mean, um, we used to have zero shifts. We used to drop our rifle and worry about things. And, and, and now, I mean, gosh, since I've gone to the one piece mounts, I mean, I could take my scope off, put it back on. I, I don't know. It's pretty unusual if I even need to change my zero a half a tenth. Uh things are held better there you know you you don't have to worry about what you're going to influence by having those rings a little in a little out you know can it on the picatinny rail a little piece of sand behind it when you put it on it's all machined together at one time and the most important thing on that rifle is that optic because that's what allows you to see and make the adjustments and if that thing's not protected and and nurtured and taken care of as best as possible then your odds aren't you know, I mean, that's uh, that one piece one. And, and there's a lot of them out there. I mean, you know, you, you make one uh, uh, spur, I think, makes one There's four or five different ones out there. But that one piece mount, I think, is uh, one of the bigger changes I've made over the years that from problems. I've made a lot of mistakes. I've had so many I've had more problems than anybody out there, you know, and I've learned from each and every one of them. One of them was by one piece mount. Right. 
So I agree. Yeah. Uh, okay. What kind of action are you running? Lone Peak Fusion. Uh, love those guys. Uh, they're out of Utah. I mean, they're, they're shooters. They're amazing people. They, their machine work is second to none. I love that. Just love everything about that action. Yeah. I think, uh, I think uh, Jeff Gurry is also running the Lone Peak. I think he mentioned that, I believe. But, um, yeah, uh, Jeff is there. There's a lot. There's, I mean, they're, 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 they're in the middle of the country there, but they're really starting to get in here. I think Heckler's running them. Jeff just switched to them. Andy's running them. They're, they're, uh, 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 Morgan's running them, right? You know, I mean, uh, Morgan's been running them for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic action. Okay. What kind of, what kind of chassis? What model? Uh, I use the ACC Elite chassis. Um, uh, model, whatever color they give me. Okay. And are, and are <laughs> yeah, you... I order, I order it and I'll be like, I don't care whether it's blue, black, or brown, as long as it, you know, as long as it works good. Uh, um, so, and then I run the Baker wings on it. I, uh, uh, I love the send it level. That's one thing about the short optics mounts is to be able to run those levels. If, if you're not running those levels, you're giving up free points. You know, I see if you watch a new shooter, I'd say 60% of the time when they're shooting a long range target and all of a sudden they're like, ah, the wind's switching or they're off the left, they're off the right, whatever. It's almost always canting that rifle. You'll, and especially with the send it level as an instructor, you'll sit back and you'll just see two red lights in there, canted, you know, three degrees right. And all of a sudden, you know, the bullet's off the right. Weird, right? And then all of a sudden the green light's on and they hit the middle of the plate, and the wind switched back. Uh, that a, a good level of any kind is great. That is a little more intuitive than some, but it doesn't matter if you're not using a level in this game, you're making a mistake. Absolutely. Yeah. Without question. It's kind of, a, yeah, you got to have it. Um, are you, are you betting your chassis? I don't No, you don't I did early on like, uh, four or five years ago. And, uh, I had, and, and boy, but hard to believe that I would say I don't, but, you know, cause I'm pretty meticulous on my group sizes and how a gun shoots and everything else, but I haven't had a need to, I mean, uh, um, so the last one I bet it was probably four or five years ago and they, they just don't move. I'm, I'm real happy with how they work. So I tighten them down more than I probably should. I don't torque them to 60. I probably closer, a little more than 75 or 80. Uh, but, uh, um, I, it's for me, I just, you know, change from one to another and get my balances right, take it in and out. And, um, uh, I don't, I don't have the time to bet them. I'm too busy. <laughs> and, uh, what, what bipod are you running? Uh, I use the two pool 99% of the time of the sky pod. Yeah. Okay. So I uh, I bought one of the original Sky Pods when they first came out. I was at the NRL finale out west, and um, and Sky had one, and I'm like, wow, I can't can't shoot out here without one of these. And uh, then I kind of got away for from it for a few years because out here we didn't have the terrain that that used it. And now as the game's getting more difficult, we're coming up with more unusual positions. Having a bipod that's really versatile for height, uh, it, you know, that, that goes from really low to really high pretty easily, whatever brand you choose to go with, uh, having that versatility to go from six inches to 12, 13 inches is pretty important. Uh, you know, and there's it, it, there's a lot of good ones, but you need more than just a six to nine Harris nowadays, you know, yeah, um, and uh and I used the six to nine Harris for a lot of years, but having that ability to go all the way in and go to 18, 19 inches um, just makes your positions more comfortable. You get less parallax error because you're not directly behind the rifle. You know, you're able to get it in a comfortable position and see more. So uh, barrel manufacturer. Hawk Hill. Uh, I've been using Hawk Hill from, Oh, at least the last five, six, seven years. And uh, I I mean, I chamber a lot of barrels and them Hawk Hill barrels. I have one bushing that fits in every barrel since they've been made because there's one guy that stroked every barrel in the last six years. 
and and he does a really good job of it. So <laughs> yes, he I, does. I'm, I'm 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 in love with them. So yeah, they, they they make a very good product, and they're really good people too. Um, okay, and muzzle brake. Uh, the MDT comp brake. Um, I I thread my barrels three quarter instead of five eighths. You know, I want to keep as much meat out on the end of the rifle as I possibly can. Most of the builds I do, I do the same thing. Uh, there's no reason to take the most important part of the barrel and out towards the crown and reduce material. So yep. we'll just keep as much out there as we can. Absolutely. Good yep. call. Okay. And uh, caliber, what caliber are you, is your go-to caliber? Uh, 6BR. I've been playing with the BRA a little bit. Uh, so my favorite caliber for years was the Dasher. Uh, I'd say by far the most accurate caliber I've ever played with. Uh, the problem with it for me was the brass, you know, uh, if you made a mistake size in the brass and it ran a little too fast for me. So at 2950, which is where my dashers like to run, I wasn't able to see as much of the bullet downrange and see, I, I, I mean, I, I seen a lot, but, um, I seen a whole lot more when I slowed down into the 28s, when I got that 2880, uh, 2800, uh, I was able to see probably 60, 70% more. And um, as far as the bullet flying into the target, not just hitting the target, right? I was able to see more of that. And uh, that that was something that the the BR, the BRA um, is easier to run in those speeds for, for me, right? I could make the Dasher run there, but it loved 2950. Uh, the BR... It likes anywhere from 2750 to 2880, right? But normally, you know, it likes that 2800, 2850. And that's a good speed to dwell time for me to to watch what goes on. So I, I started with the BRA. I'm wondering if that 40 degree shoulder, I mean, when they're all in the node, they're all equally accurate. When they're out of the node, that dasher has just a little bit of an edge on it. And I've been playing with the BRA, hoping that I could have the BR speeds, but have that out of note accuracy of the dasher. They're all accurate enough to win. It doesn't matter. And sorry, I'm sure you're, are you running the burger 105, 109, eight tips? What are you running? Uh, I ran the 109s in this match, but the one I'm a 105 burger fan. I mean, that's the best bullet ever made. <laughs> I do trim and point mine. I do all kinds of crazy stuff to mine. I have for, for years because I'm obsessed with, those things that probably don't matter. Uh, but the, the one Oh five hybrid, I, I just have never seen a bad one. It does everything it's supposed to do all the time. And, uh, uh, I'm running a little low on them and I figured I would go with a little higher BC and went to the one Oh nine just for this match. Um, but, uh, I'm really a, a, a one Oh five fan across the board, really any of those burger bullets. It doesn't matter. The one Oh eight hunters. I ran those for a year, loved them. The 108 hollow point boat tails, man, if you want to shoot 100, 200 and 600 yard groups, buy a box of 100, you know, 108 boat tails. Those things shoot out of everything. Um, you know, I mean, they're, it, they're all good bullets. You know, if it's a burger, it's going to shoot somewhere between 20 and 120,000. You know, just shove it in there and put some powder in. It's going to be good. You know, I, last year I was running, um, like I, I ran the 108 elite hunter. And then uh, then I got low and I was running and then I got some one Oh fives and one Oh nines. And what I noticed is I didn't have to change anything on those burger bullets. I mean, the seating depth <laughs> between a one Oh five and one Oh eight and one Oh nine, and even the powder weight. I mean, like you talk about hitting the easy button and right. they all shot great. I mean, every one of them, <laughs> like how nice right. you don't change, you don't change your seating die. You just shove, pick, pick a number, right. You know, 30 grains of powder in the daggone thing and a BR or, and I run the same in the BRA or 32.2 in the in the Dasher. And if it doesn't shoot at 32.2, go to 32.3. It might shoot a little better. But, I mean, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it, they, they, they're unless you're running some of the other brass out there, maybe you're running 31 and a half grains. But you, once you find that reasonable load that gets you to an approximate speed, I mean, uh, those bullets are going to shoot. And they're going to shoot really, really well. And they're going to shoot in and out of the node. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're good enough all the time. They're good enough to win a match anywhere. So I agree. Yeah. They're, they're yep. it's a great bullet. And 
Okay, so I think we are about to wrap things up tonight. So are there any sponsors or special folks that you would like to recognize during the podcast? Most importantly, my wife, because she does without me all the time. Uh, and she runs the house and takes care of the dog and the kids and everybody, everything else and uh, allows me to do this mentally free. So, you know, from Friday to Sunday night, you know, all those problems are her problems and she don't put them on me, which allows me to compete, which is, I I can't say enough about that. I mean, for me, having that illness of being a competitor is, is uh, the freedom to be able to do that is pretty awesome. Uh, most importantly, I got to thank MDT. They, I, they're great to work with. I've been working with them. They allow me a lot of freedoms. They help me with the van. I drive the van all around. They, they help all the shooters with all the equipment in the van and, and that allows me to, to do a lifestyle that I want to do. Um, Vortex Optics, you know, I, I've been running them from the very beginning. My first scope that I started with was the old Viper PST Gen 1 that had just come out, right? And uh, uh, I still have it in my safe and still have it on my hunting rifle, you know what I mean? So, and, and the beauty of it is when, when I couldn't uh, afford to shoot, if I drove it over with my pickup truck, I'd have another one within a week. And, and, you know, when I finally got enough money to buy my first scope to be able to get something replaced, if, if, if I, if I heard it and, and get it in a timely manner, allowed me to continue to, to, to compete. And that was, that was a huge thing. Uh, and then, you know, we got Hawk Hill, Bix and Andy, uh, and Lone Peak, uh, you know, and that's, uh, um, they all treat me really great. I try to only associate with, uh, and only buy products from amazing companies, you know, Burger Lapua, like, I mean, if they're supporting the sport, if they're amazing people, and, and I, I try to only buy those products. Right. And, uh, you know, and, and that's, that goes for powder that goes for everything. I mean, if they're, if you're a part of this game and you're supporting the game, I want to play, and you're a good person, I'm going to buy your product, right? And I'm going to recommend everybody buys your product. And, uh, um, you know, and if not, then I'll find someone out there who needs to make that product. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, and everybody should do that, right? I mean, you know, um, you know, if you, if you go to a chassis, I mean, there, there's you, there's me, there, you know, I mean, there's, um, they're all great. They're all great equipment. They're great people. They're in the sports. They're on the tables all the time. You should support the people that support this game. So, yeah, I agree. Well, I'll tell you what, Keith, it's been, uh, it's, uh, it was great to see you win the match and, you know, it's been, it's been a long time coming. Uh, you know, I was, I should have called you that we, we kind of had that thing going for a long time, even, <laughs> even after, you know, even after you started running, yeah. MVP, I'd still call, I didn't call you. I should have called you. But I was, you know, I was super happy that after all this time that you're able to get that victory. I knew it meant a lot to you. And, 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 and I know it meant a lot to a lot of your friends and people that you shoot with and your manufacturers. So that was a great thing. So congratulations on that, Keith. Well-deserved. Uh, you're a student of the game and, and, you know, you help out a lot of people in this sport. So I know that was a, a big deal for a lot of people. So good job. Thank you. And uh, I can't wait to see it another match in the next week or two. And, uh, uh, it feels good to be getting back and hopefully we'll get to do a few more of these podcasts. I think we, I think we probably will. Good deal. Okay. Well, I think this is going to wrap up, uh, episode six of season one of the winner's circle. Uh, Keith, thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight and sharing your wisdom and your knowledge and experiences. It's been a great help. And, uh, my name is Phil Cashin and thank you for watching and listening. Have a good evening. Thank you for doing the podcast. My pleasure.